This is the second video in a series devoted to abstract algebra. In the first video, we started our review looking at sets and functions, injective and surjective functions, as well as equivalence relations. Today, we're going to do a bit more review before really getting into the meat of new objects for abstract algebra in our next video. So today, we're going to talk about some things that have to do with the integers. In particular, we'll look at the principle of mathematical induction, and we'll also look at the Euclidean algorithm, divisibility, and uh, the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. But we're going to go through this kind of quickly because all of this is from a previous course. In fact, the previous course that I'm alluding to is a standard introduction to proof writing course, and I've got a full course of that on the channel already if you'd like to check that out, where we go into all of these things much more in depth. Okay, so let's start with this principle of mathematical induction. And so let's say our goal is to prove that the statement P of N is true for all natural numbers N. So this is a family of mathematical statements uh, indexed by natural numbers. And so our strategy will start with something called a base case. And that will be to show that P of one is true. And then we'll follow that up with an induction step. And that's to show that P of K implies P of K plus one. So in other words, if P of K is true, then P of K plus one is true. And this works because if we've set up the base case, then the induction step takes everything else. So the induction step will show that P one implies P two, and then P two implies P three, implies P four, implies P five, so on and so forth, meaning they're all true. Okay, so let's go through a couple of examples. So let's first show that the sum of the first n squares is n times n plus one times two n plus one over six. Okay, so let's get to it. So let's start with our base case. And in this case, the base case will be n equals one. I guess I should say here that there's another version of induction called um, strong induction, which we won't be covering. You can check that out on the other video for that other course that I was talking about. And also, sometimes this may not start in n equals one. It might be for a subset of uh, natural numbers. Okay, so anyway, the base case here will be n equals one, in which case we have one squared, which is equal to one, which is the same thing as one times one plus one times two plus one all over six. So notice one squared looks like the left-hand side, and then this object over here looks like the right-hand side. Okay, so now let's do our induction step, and generally that starts with an induction hypothesis. So let's suppose that for some k bigger than or equal to one, we know that p of k is true. So in other words, this statement holds where we replace n with k. So we have one squared plus two squared ending at k squared equals k times k plus one times two k plus one all over six. And now from here we will consider the next case. So the next case will be the k plus first case. So we'll have one squared plus two squared ending at k plus one squared, but I'm gonna leave the k squared in there because we'll need it. And notice that we can apply the induction hypothesis to this stuff that I'm putting in these blue parentheses. So applying the induction hypothesis to that will give us k times k plus one times two k plus one all over six. And then I'm gonna take that k plus one squared and rewrite it as six times k plus one squared all over six, just to like preemptively give myself a common denominator. Now let's factor out a common factor, and the common factor here will be k plus one. So notice I've got k plus one as a factor of the first term and of the second term. So pulling that k plus one out, I'll also pull out an over six out, we'll be left with, what is it? K times two K plus one times six times K plus one. So something like that. 
Now let's see what this simplifies to. So multiplying this through, we will have two times k squared, and then we'll have k plus six k, so that's gonna be seven k, and then we'll also have plus six from this term right here. But let's notice that factors, and that factors into k plus two times two k plus three. So let's write this out. We have our final thing is k plus one, times k plus two, times two times k plus three, all over six. But that's exactly this formula where we replace n with k plus one, which means that we have our statement. We have the kth statement implies the k plus first statement, finishing the proof of this statement by induction. Let's do another. So for our next example, we'll show for all natural numbers n that the number nine divides four to the power three n plus eight. Okay, so let's jump into it. So our base case here will again be the case when n is equal to one. So let's notice if n is equal to one, we end up with four cubed plus eight. But four cubed is equal to 64, plus eight is equal to 72, but 72 is equal to nine times eight. But now rewriting this, like this term being a multiple of nine as a divisibility relationship, we have nine divides four to the three plus eight. Okay, so that means the base case holds. Now let's make an induction hypothesis. So let's suppose for some k bigger than or equal to one, we have, let's see, nine divides four to the three k plus eight. And before we look at the k plus first case, let's decode this into like some sort of equation. Okay, so this is the same thing as saying that four to the three k plus eight is equal to nine times something. Maybe we'll call this something m, where in this case m is a natural number. So by the definition of divisibility, we just need it to be an integer, but clearly everything is positive here, so it's definitely a natural number. Okay, so now let's consider the k plus first case. So that means we're gonna look at an object four to the three k plus one plus eight. Okay, so let's see what we get out of this. So this is going to be equal to, let's see, four to the three times four to the three K plus eight. So something like that. But notice that we can take this equation right here from our induction hypothesis and reorder it a little bit to have four to the three K is equal to nine times M minus eight. And that's exactly what we'll use here. So that allows us to write this as four cubed, which is the same thing as 64 times nine times M minus eight plus eight. So we've got something going on like that. But now notice that this will give us nine times 64 M, and then we'll have minus eight times 64 plus eight. Okay, or maybe we should write that as minus 64 times eight. But now we can think about this number eight as being some sort of variable right now, and then combining like terms, this is gonna give us nine times 64 M minus 63 times eight. But 63 is equal to nine times seven. So that means we can factor a nine out of the whole thing and we have what's left over 64 times M and then seven times eight, which is 56, so minus 56. So let's see. We've started here with four to the three times k plus one plus eight, and we've ended here, that thing is a multiple of nine. So now putting this all together over here, which is like slightly misplaced on the board, but I think it's okay. This implies that nine divides four times three to the k plus one plus eight. 
as needed to finish up this uh, proof. Okay, let's do one more induction problem. So for our last example, we'll consider the Fibonacci numbers. So that is the recursively defined sequence by f of zero equals zero, f of one equals one, and then f of n plus two equals f of n plus one plus f of n for all n bigger than or equal to zero. And then we'll show that the sum of odd Fibonacci numbers equals an even Fibonacci number. So in other words, the sum f1 plus f3 ending at f2n minus 1 equals f2n. Okay, so let's do this. And like before, we'll do it with induction because that's what we're doing right now. So our base case will be the n equals 1 case. But notice if n is equal to 1, we see that 2n minus 1 is also equal to 1. So that means we get f1 just on the left hand side, but f1 is equal to 1, but that's the same thing as f2. And that can be easily seen by our recursion here. Notice that f2 is equal to f1 plus f0, that's 1 plus 0, which is 1. Okay, so now let's make our induction hypothesis. So we'll suppose for some k bigger than or equal to 1, we have this statement holds. So f1 plus f3 ending at f2k minus 1 equals f2k. And now we'll consider the next case. So let's consider f1 plus f3 ending at f2k plus 1. That's the next odd number. But I'm going to write this as f2k minus 1 plus f 2k plus 1, just to put the previous term in there, so we can easily apply the induction hypothesis. And like I said, we'll apply that induction hypothesis. Let's consider that green grouping. And applying the induction hypothesis to that green grouping will give us f sub 2k, then we add that to f sub 2k plus 1, but then by our defining recursion of the Fibonacci sequence, that is exactly f sub 2k plus 2, which is f sub 2 times the quantity k plus 1 as needed to finish this proof off. Okay, so now let's move on to something else. Now we're going to look at something called the division algorithm. So let's suppose that a and b are integers where b is positive. So in other words, b is a natural number. Then there are unique q and r such that a equals b times q plus r and r is between 0 and b, including 0 but not including b. So this is like our standard division with remainder. So I would say that q is the quotient and r is the remainder. So like I said, this is the division with remainder that you probably learned in elementary school. Okay, so let's see the proof here. So let's consider the following set, which maybe I'll call capital A. And that set is going to be of the following form. So it will be A minus B times, let's say, X as X runs through all integers. But then we're going to take this set and intersect it with the non-negative integers. So 0, 1, 2, 3, so on and so forth. But now notice that this is a subset of the integers that's bounded below. But since this is a subset of the integers that's bounded below, it has a minimal element. So that's something called the well ordering principle, which again is covered in one of those previous courses. So since it has a minimal element, we'll probably want to use that minimal element. And I'll set R equal to the minimum of this set A. Okay, but notice that means R is of the form A minus BX. So let's set Q to be equal to the X corresponding to R. Again, R is inside of A, so that means it's of the form A minus BX. Let's just set Q equal to that X. Okay, so notice that means we have r is equal to a minus b times q, which can be rewritten as a equals b times q plus r. Okay, so now we just have to show that r is like the right size. 
So in other words, it is between zero and B. And we'll do that by way of contradiction. So by way of contradiction, let's suppose that R is bigger than or equal to B. And then we'll show that this falls apart here. Okay, so what does that mean? That means we can write R as B plus M, where M is bigger than or equal to zero. That's definitely true. If R is bigger than or equal to B, then we can achieve R by adding something to B. Now let's loop that back into our equation right here. So that's gonna give us B plus M equals A minus B times Q. But we can rewrite that to see that M is equal to A minus B times the quantity Q plus one. After moving that B over and then factoring the B out, I think that's pretty straightforward arithmetic there. But notice, what do we have here? Now we have this, this is in the set A, just by its shape here. But let's also notice by construction, since B is bigger than zero, we have M is strictly less than R, which is the minimum of A. So what have we done? We have found an element from A that is smaller than its minimum, but that's our contradiction. So we have a contradiction, meaning that R is not bigger than or equal to B, which means it's strictly less than B. So R is strictly less than B. But then by the fact that R comes from this set, which only includes non-negative integers, we have R is bigger than or equal to zero. So there we have it. So that proves the existence of a Q and an R. Now let's prove the uniqueness. So we just finished proving the existence of the Q and R, satisfying all of those rules. Now we'll prove the uniqueness. So let's suppose that we have two sets of numbers, Q1, R1, and Q2, R2, so that A equals B times Q1 plus R1 and a equals B times Q2 plus R2. Okay, but notice that immediately tells us that B times Q1 plus R1 equals B times Q2 plus R2. But now let's, without loss of generality, assume that we have some ordering on the R's. So let's assume that R1 is less than or equal to R2. Well, we've got two numbers. One of them has to be bigger than or equal to another, so that's not problematic. And now let's notice that we have R2 minus R1 is the same thing as, so that's moving the R1 over here. We're gonna move the B times Q2 over here, giving us B times, let's see, Q1 minus Q2. Okay, and then let's like flesh this out a little bit more. So since R1 is less than or equal to R2, and R1 and R2 are both between zero and B, then that means we have R1, R2 minus R1 is also between zero and B. So that follows pretty easily. Okay, so let's look at this. We have R2 minus R1 is a multiple of B, but it's between zero and B, not including B. Well, the only multiple of B in this range is zero. So that means that R2 minus R1, in fact, must be equal to zero. Again, because it's the only multiple of B in that allowed range. But this tells us that R1 is equal to R2. But then very clearly it follows that Q1 is also equal to Q2, finishing the uniqueness portion of this proof. Okay, so now we're gonna prove something called Bezu's Lemma. Now we're gonna prove something called Bezu's Lemma, which has to do with the GCD of two integers. Now, again, in that previous course that I've been talking about, we looked at what the GCD of integers is. So perhaps you'd like to review that if you need to. Okay, so let's look at our statement here. So let's suppose that A and B are non-zero integers, 
Then there are other integers, x and y, such that ax plus by equals the GCD of a and b. So in other words, we can write the GCD of two numbers as a linear combination of those numbers. Notice there isn't anything here about uniqueness, and that's because this writing is not unique, as we'll see via example. Okay, so this proof will involve a pretty similar strategy to what we did in the previous proof. So let's also consider a set in this proof. Maybe since we used A in the previous proof, let's use B, although we could reuse A because we're in a different proof now. Okay, so let's consider the set B, which is A times U plus B times V as U and V run over all integers, but then we're gonna intersect that with the natural numbers. So that means we only have positive integers within this set. But notice that B is a subset of natural numbers, but given that B is a subset of the natural numbers, by the well ordering principle, it has a minimum. Now let's call that minimum D. So call it D. So in other words, we have D is equal to the minimum of our set B. And then, but B is everything of the form AU plus BV. So let's also take X and Y so that we have AX plus BY equals D. So in other words, they're the corresponding U's and V's that make D inside of that set B. Again, it's important to remind ourselves that B is only natural numbers. Okay, so now let's make the following claim, which will finish this whole thing off. And that claim is that D is in fact equal to the GCD of A and B. Okay, so in order to do that, we first need to show that it's a common divisor. And then after showing it's a common divisor, we'll show that it is in fact the greatest such common divisor. Okay, so let's get to showing that it's the common divisor. So let's do the division algorithm with D and a. So what does that mean? That means that we can write A as D times Q plus R, where R is between zero and, let's see, it needs to be D, but not including D. And now we're gonna break this into cases. So the first case is actually us being totally done. So the case one will be R is equal to zero. But notice if R is equal to zero, we have D divides A, which is kind of where we wanted to end up. So let's just put a check mark here. And then we'll move into case number two, which is R is not equal to zero, which means that zero is a strict lower bound. So R is between zero and D. So now let's take this equation right here and rewrite it. So that'll give us R equals A minus D times Q. And then we'll take our version of D that we built over here and put it into this equation involving R. That'll give us R equals A minus AX plus BY times Q. But then regrouping some things, we get this is equal to A times one minus X and then plus B times negative Q times Y. But that means that R is equal to A times something plus B times something, which means that R is in our set B, as that's the entry fee for being inside of B. But that's a problem. Why is it a problem? Because we found an element of B, namely R, that is strictly less than D, which is the minimum of B. So that means that we have a contradiction and thus R cannot not equal zero, meaning that R has to equal zero. But in the case R equals zero, we have D divides A. But then I'll just put down here, similarly, D also divides B. 
It's the exact same argument where we just replace A with B. So that means we in fact do have A and B are a common divisor. Now let's show that they're the greatest such common divisor. So we just showed that D was a common divisor of A and B. Now we'll show that it's the greatest common divisor. So let's suppose we have another common divisor. Let's call it C. So we have C is a natural number such that C divides A and C divides B. But let's notice that that means that A is equal to C times, let's say maybe M, and B is equal to C times N for M and N, which are integers. So that's just the definition of divisibility. Okay, now where are we gonna go from here? Well, we probably wanna use this equation here. So let's see, we have D is equal to AX plus BY, but then that's gonna be equal to C times MX plus C times NY. But notice that's in fact equal to C times MX plus NY. But now reading from here, to here, we see that C divides D. But that's exactly the condition we needed for the greatest part of the greatest common divisor. So that means that D is in fact the GCD. Okay, so now that we've shown that it's possible to rewrite the GCD as a linear combination of two integers, let's provide an algorithm for actually doing that. So before looking at the Euclidean algorithm, I'd like to make a midpoint exercise. And that is how to take one solution to that equation that we just built from Bezu's lemma and build it into an infinite family of solutions. So this says if D is equal to the GCD of A and B, and then AX plus BY equals D, which we showed to be possible, then for all integers t, we have a times the quantity x plus b over d times t plus b times y minus a plus d over t equals d. And this gives you an infinite family of solutions to this type of equation over the integers. Notice that it's definitely over the integers because d is a divisor of b, meaning that b over d is uh, an integer and D is a divisor of A, so that's also an integer. So we're good to go there. Okay, so now let's look at the Euclidean algorithm via this example. We'd like to find the GCD of 272 and 571, and then find, in this case, infinitely many solutions to the equation 272x plus 571y equals their GCD, which is to be determined. Okay, so the first step is to use the division algorithm with 571 and 272. So that allows us to write 571 as, let's see, it is 272 times two plus 27. So again, that's just division with remainder. And then the next step is where the division algorithm takes hold. So we'll take this 272 and that'll be our new dividend. So let's bring that down here, 272. And then we'll take 27 and that'll be our new divisor. So let's see, the divisor becomes the dividend and the remainder becomes the new divisor. If you wanna use those words involving quotient and remainder. Okay, so here we have 27 times 10 plus two. So that's just doing the division algorithm with 272 and 27. And now we'll again do that again. So we'll have 27 come over here and be the new dividend. And we'll have two come over here and be the new divisor. So that'll give us 27 is equal to 13 times two, or maybe we'll write it as two times 13 plus one because it's 26 plus one. And now that we've ended at one, we know that the greatest common divisor is one. And the general rule is the last non-zero remainder in this process will in fact be the GCD. It just happens that if you end with one, 
then you know that you've gotten to the GCD because the next remainder will clearly be zero. So that means we've determined here that the GCD of these two numbers is in fact one. Now, just for a little bit of terminology, if the GCD of two numbers is one, we say they're relatively prime. So that means that 272 and 571 are relatively prime. Okay, but now these three equations here can be inverted to find a solution to our Bezu's lemma type problem. So let's do that. So by inverted, I mean I'm gonna rewrite them where I solve for the remainder. So this bottom one allows me to write one as, let's see, 27 minus two times 13. And then here we'll have two is equal to 272 minus 27 times 10. And then finally here, we'll be able to write 27 as 571 minus 272 times two. Okay, so that's looking good. Now I'm actually gonna introduce a little bit of color coding here. So my numbers 571 and 272, I'll make magenta. So let's see, this one was 571 and this one was 272. And my reasoning for that is I wanna consider those as variables. So in other words, I'll be combining like terms with those things. Okay, so now from here, we'll take this equation involving 27 and insert it into the equation below. So let's maybe write that down here with this green star. So that means we'll have two is equal to, let's see, I have magenta 272 and then minus uh, 27, but notice 27 is that object right there. So let's see, 571 and then 272 times two and we're subtracting them and we multiply that by 10. So we've got this version of two. But now if we expand this and combine like terms, that's gonna give us the following object. So we'll have uh, 272. So 272 times 21. So that's from uh, 1 272 minus 20 272s. And then it'll be minus 571 times, let's see, what's our next number? That will be 10. Okay, so we've got something like that. And then our next step will be to take this version of 27 and insert it down here into this equation. And then this version of two, actually this version of two right here that we've ended with and insert it into this equation. Okay, so let's put that down here with this purple star. So let's see, that's gonna give us one equals 27, but we have 27 is that form up there. So that's 572 and then minus 272 times two. So we have that. Okay, so again, that's our 27 right here. And then after that, we'll have minus 13 times this version of two that we have up here. So this is gonna be 272 times 21 and then minus 571 times 10. Okay, so we've got this kind of gnarly expression, but notice that we can combine like terms if we view this 571 as one of our quote unquote variables. And then also this 272 as one of our variables. So I'll, okay, so I'll let you, so I'll let you work out the details of the coefficients, but we'll arrive that at the top of the next board. And then we will take this single solution and build it into an infinite family of solutions using our rule over here. So putting everything together from the previous board, we have the following equation. 571 times 131 plus 272 times negative 275 is equal to one.
Now let's expand that to an infinite family of solutions using our rule over here, which means we're going to multiply each number by one over the GCD and then by this T here. In this case, the GCD is one, so this is pretty straightforward. Okay, so here we'll put minus 272 times T, and here we'll put plus 571 times t. Notice those two terms will all cancel when we expand this, but this does give us an infinite family of solutions as t ranges through all integers. And now notice that our maybe base solution has a negative number here and a positive number here. But using our family, we can actually change where the negative number is, which will actually be somewhat useful later on down the line for us. And so let's, for instance, take t equal to 1, and we'll see that we get this new solution. So we have 571 times negative 141, and then plus our 272 times the quantity, let's see, 296 equals 1. So we've just moved where the positive number is. Okay, so I'm going to end with some results involving prime numbers. We're not going to prove them, we're just going to review the results, and then I'll leave you with some warm-up exercises. Okay, so here are those three classic number theory results. So I guess I should point out that some number theory will be useful for dealing with groups, which we're about to look at in the next video, although definitely not all of a number theory course, as a number theory course could be an entire semester-long course. But here are three maybe important results that won't be explicitly used very often, but are just useful to keep in mind. So the first is that there are infinitely many prime numbers. The second one says that if P divides AB and P is prime, then P divides A or P divides B. And I'm actually going to sketch a very short proof of that right here because it uses like a nice trick. So if P does not divide A, then the GCD of P and A is equal to 1, which means we can write PX plus AY equal to 1. But then, since P divides AB, we also know that A times B is equal to P times Z for some integer Z. And then maybe I'll leave the rest of this as like a little bit of an exercise, but from this step right here and this step right here, or from those two equations, it's pretty easy to arrive at the fact that P divides B. And that'll prove this statement. So if P does not divide A, then P has to divide B. Okay, and then our final, like maybe important number theory result, just to keep in mind, is called the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. And that says that every natural number bigger than or equal to 2 can be uniquely factored into primes. So in other words, we can write n as p1 to the r1 times p2 to the r2 up to pk to the rk. And that uniqueness is, of course, up to some rearranging. Okay, so now I'm going to leave you with some warm-ups. Here are four nice warm-up exercises based on what we saw today. So the first is to show that negative 1 squared plus 2 squared minus 3 squared plus 4 squared minus 5 squared. So it's the alternating sum of squares ending at minus 1 to the n times n squared is equal to minus 1 to the n times n times n plus 1 over 2. So this is like an alternating version of that thing that we started the video with. Next, let's show that 24 divides 5 to the 2n minus 1 for all natural numbers n. Next, let's find the GCD of 123 and 672, and then an infinite family of solutions to the equation 123x plus 672y equals their GCD. Maybe importantly, let's look at two explicit solutions that have x positive, y negative, and vice versa. And then finally, let's finish that proof that we sketched on the last board. So if p divides a, b, that implies that p divides a or p divides b. So there's not much left to 
to finish there, but I think that would be a nice exercise as well. And that's a good place to stop. 